Hello everybody, nice to see you again. This is Boost Knowledge and as you can see we are doing history today. And the last time we did the very complicated battles of the Wars of the Roses between the Lancasters and the Yorks, resulting in a Tudor victory. And that changed history hugely for Britain. But wait, let's go back a few hundred years ago to the 11th century where we'll meet the Norman invasion. And uh, if you see this image, you might not think it's the real Britain versus Norman battle, because it is. And well done, you pointed that out, because this is the Battle of Stamford Bridge between the Eng English and the Vikings. If you saw all those muscular men, like... Well, this guy, well done, because that's exactly what we're doing today. But wait, in a battle which features the Normans or the guys from France, why are the England, English, and the Vikings fighting? Well, let's dive into deeper information. So before we look at this topic in great detail, we need to learn some background information. So the 10th and 11th century was a very brilliant time for England. Well, brilliant, that's sarcasm, obviously. So there's the Anglo-Saxon troops and the Viking troops. And it's like Anglo-Saxons get control of England, Vikings come in, boom! Vikings are now in control of England, boom! Anglo-Saxons are back now. And it's like this to and fro sequence that caused lots of chaos and stuff, especially change of culture, etc. So, uh, this guy, Edward the Confessor, who was a former king of England before the Battle of Sanford Bridge and Hastings, he was once put in exile because, uh, of course, because of the Vikings in Normandy, where he then returned to England after the Anglo-Saxons won, and he then became king because he was the rightful heir. But then, he, after his reign, he died in January 1066. Boom! And without an heir! So it's like, everybody's like, wait, so... Who will be his successor? So there are actually many choices, not only in England, but across Europe. So firstly, this this guy called Edgar Aisling, who is the grandnephew of Edward the Confessor. But he's only a teenager. What can he do? The second choice is Harold Godwinson, who is the key advisor of Edward, and may have just seemed like a co-king. However, this this might be only a myth, which where it is not really thought to be true in some sources, that Harold Godwinson, sorry, Edward the Confessor, actually wanted Harold Godwinson to rule after him in his will, in his will. However, this might not be true, but this is just maybe, well, never mind. The third choice is Harold Hadrada, and he's a Viking. Obviously. But when you think, well, Vikings are just here for invasion, they're really not kings. They can't be kings. They don't have the right. Well, you'll be run. wrong. Because as I said before, Vikings and Anglo-Saxons ruled England over a period of time. To and fro. And unluckily, one of the former, former English Viking kings called... Uh, sorry, guys. I can't pronounce this correctly. I think it's Harthaknut. Harthaknut or something. Well, he made a agreement with this Norway king, Norman Viking king, called Magnus, that if Harthaknut died before Magnus, then Magnus will take the throne. Take the English throne. And this guy called Harald Hadrada, who has spent like his whole life fighting in the whole of Europe, the Mediterranean, etc. Well, when he returned back to Norway and was Grand King, he was thinking, well, let's invade England. That's my last great conquest, and this will be great. And uh, 
He literally thought that he had the right to be king, which kind of he had. The, fir- the fourth guy is William the Bastard. And it- why he's called the Bastard? Mm, not very appropriate to mention on this channel. So, he actually made an agreement with Edward the Confessor. And William the Bastard, let us call him Wil- William, uh, he lived in Normandy, northern France. W- which uh, I pointed Edward the Confessor, Edward, had once went there in exile. So both of them were actually good friends, Edward and William. And Edward actually made agreement with William, William saying, Well, bro, want to be king after me? William's like, yes, sir. And then the agreement was that after Edward died, William would become king. And actually, Harold Godwinson once visited Normandy before Edward's death and swore on the holy relics that he will give the throne to William after Edward's death. But, well, he might just have sworn on the holy relics just because, well, William was holding his family on the hostage. That's not even known. For sure. Okay. We've done the background. So there's one, two, three, four. Four candidates for the, uh, for the new king of England. Number one, relative but pretty weak. Number two, close relative, pretty strong, but challenged. Number three, very strong guy, but, well, you're a Viking. And if you take the king, that's amazing. And number four, well, there's promises that you can be king, but are you going to get it? Spoiler, everybody, the king is going to be one of these four. So the battle of Stamford Bridge. Let's go into the details. So actually, Godwinson was guarding close to the Isle of Wight against William. But when you ask why William just didn't launch his invasion, like, now? Actually, the wind was blowing the wrong way. The wind was actually blowing from north to south, which William literally couldn't cross the English Channel, which he tried and failed. So, well, Godwinson was guarding this... Okay, along the coast, but then he ran out, ran out of surprise, and he was like, well, guys, let us all go home. But then, about, like, a few days later, Hadrada was, there was a report from the north that Hadrada had actually attacked in the summer and went up the Owls, that is actually north of England, that's a river, went up the Great Owls, and then advanced into York. And then had rather defeat lots of locos, including an army from Edwin and Walker at the Battle of Fulford, September the 20th. And then there's the surrender of York. And uh, had rather and his forces demanded hostages from the locos and support too, for had rather being king. Godwin says, like, you can't do that. That's all unfair. And Godwin says, well, this is so unfair, I just disassembled my army, I'll have to reassemble them again, which he did. And in st- stunning speed, he made the journey all the way from London to York, a distance about 200 miles, in just four days, covering 50 miles each day, and gathering his army through the past, which consisted of mostly house cars, which are bodyguards, things, which um, are people who have land and power, but they're also capable of fighting, and fields, uh, yeah, fields, uh, who are tribal tribal militias, which have existed since six hundred and five A.D., who are able-bodied free males who join together and fight. Well, they're able to fight then. And actually, uh, bef- I'm just giving you another piece of background information. The sequence or the status, hierarchical, hierarchical status of the uh, Old England before 1066 stands thus. So there's the signing or the sovereigns, the Athens. I, I told you about a- Athens, I mean, Edgar Aethling. He is actually called, means Edgar Prince. So, uh, in Old England, they weren't actually surnames. Uh, they were called first name the blah blah blah. 
like Edgar the uh, Aetheling, Edward the Confessor, William the Bastard, etc. Okay, the, after princes, there's earls. And after earls, there's called this thing called hurls. Then there's things, then house earls, then there's um, other things like reeves and free tenants and serfs and cottages, and then at the bottom, it's slaves. And I mean, ser- serfs are not 100% slaves. Ser- serfs still have some rights, although they don't have many. Slaves have free zero. So, well, this is a sort of hierarchy just for some information. Okay, let's go back. Where was I? Oh, yes. Harold had rather had uh, defeated the army of locals, York surrenders, and boom, demands hostages and support. Godinson's like, no way, and made the journey in four days. Gathered lots of support, with the, by the way. The funny thing is that Hadrada, Harold Hadrada's army literally didn't know that Godinson could make this so quick. So they're like, well, yeah, Godinson knows this by now, but it literally is just going to take him like up the week or so. Oh, no. They're right here now. And this was the element of surprise because it literally made the Vikings 100 was unprepared. They was waiting on on the east and the west of Stamford Bridge, a town in the I mean not a town like a place on the east east of York, and where they were waiting for surprise and support for them to continue going down into central England and London later. However. The invasion, sorry, the counterattack of Godwinson actually was the element of surprise that Godwinson possessed, which left the Vikings, well, vulnerable to the attack. So, well, let's go, battle time. Godwinson was actually delayed by a Viking soldier on the west of the river. And this is actually a myth. That the soldier was dodging arrows and uh, killing every challenger and slaying them and was, well, hugely muscular. And the whole army just couldn't get through the bridge, Stamford Bridge. But then, boom, there's this guy, Anglo-Saxon, who just sailed down through the river on a boat and then attacked the uh, Viking from beneath. And then the Anglo Saxons were able to pass, pass, into the. Uh, into the battlefield. So although, they weren't they were delayed. The Anglo Saxons were still able to pass, but then, this the, this comes to drawback. Godwinson, if Godwinson literally tackled the arm, enemy with surprise, they would just have, Godwinson would just, the England English. Will have just win by a hundred percent because there's no no way people can stop them. But then, well, you were slowed, and the enemy had actually hadn't enough time to form a shield war against Godwinson. And both sides charged, and boom, there was this fighting and fighting and fighting, and well, which didn't end. And it looks like both sides are going to end in a stalemate. Nah, bro, this is just a stalemate. I don't think either side is going to win. So the result is that, well, Will and the Bastard is going to, just going to come from themselves and blah, 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 blah. No, that's not exactly what happened. What happened was, what I, what I mentioned before, that Harold Godwinson didn't really have his, had, had left the army, army in a surprise attack. His enemy, so Harold Adrana and most of his men weren't fully armed, and th- most of them didn't have the helmets. Thus, the Anglo Saxons were able to spot the weaknesses and fight against them, which gradually led to, well, the, an English victory. So, well, England is going to win. Wait, no, comes here comes the counter attack, a group of Norwegians reinforced by the troops known as the Ors and it's called the Ors Storm. It was it actually checked the English army, but then they were still overwhelmed by the English because they were 
too unprepared and, well, had rather was slain by an arrow in the eye. So, well, the casualties of this battle was really high. Mm, actually, the strength of both armies, in, the English army had about, like, uh, I mean, in total, 12,500 to 17,000, and the anti-English army, which consisted of uh, Nor Norwegians, Orkneys, and R English rebels, consisted of about 12,000 to 17,000, including the uh, including the reinforcements. But then the losses for the English are about only 5,000, which, I mean, it's a great number, not only 5,000, are 5,000, but that's actually quite small compared to the Norwegian or the Viking loss of 6,000 to 800 as a minimum. So there's a myth, because so many died on such a small battlefield, that 50 years later, the field was still whitened by bleached bones in the battlefield. And that's just a myth, because, well, there's a lot of that today, there's like 900 years ago. But that's a myth. And it still can tell us how many people that died. So the Vikings were chased down to the Great Owls and they were forced to retreat. And actually, the English were quite good to the Vikings. They just said, well, bro, we are just letting you leave. But you will never ever invade again or we will just smash you to pieces. Don't do that again. And allowed them safe passage out of England. And actually, the casualty was, was so high that the Vikings only needed 24 out of their 300 ships to go back home. Well, boom, Mr. Harold Godwinson, you've done it. And you've uh, defended yourself against one of the invaders. You've defeated Mr. Harold Hadrada. And you're just going to defeat William the Bastard in the south. Well, we'll see. Just a summary of this battle. The result was the win of England, an England victory. Location, uh, Stamford Bridge, the East Riding, Yorkshire. The time was 25th of, 25th of September, 1066, and that is a Monday. And, well, that's the result, guys. The Battle of Sanford Bridge is actually a very important battle, and it actually marks the end of the Viking era. Wait a second, did Vikings just stop invading England from the Battle of Sanford Bridge? Actually no, three years later, a Viking Danish invasion will come again, but with little success. And actually, the Battle of Sanford Bridge marks the end of complete Viking domination over England. Which means that, well, the, there are going to be, uh, 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 like, Viking invasions again, but they'll just slowly decrease in power and decrease and decrease until they have no dominance at all. And actually, the Battle of Stamford Bridge is a turning point of all this. So, well, I guess that's everything for this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Enjoy this lecture. The next series is coming out in less than a week. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and we'll see you next time. Also, yes, please subscribe to Boost Nudge. We're getting to 50 subscribers.